exciting events in the Middle East. Maybe you'd like to touch on that. Again. It's been a while since you talked about that. Touch on the latest uh, Middle East prophetic implications. Tom, thanks. Where'd you go? Oh, there you are. I just heard a voice. Uh, the implications of uh, the prophetic scenario, and boy, is it getting exciting. That's all I can say. So uh, The Middle East is lining up so closely to the Bible. Iran, Persia getting nuclear weapons, Russia supplying the reactors, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, A IIB, which is paving the Silk Road from the, the um, armies of the East are going to have this super throughway all the way to Europe. I mean, it's, it's going to be the largest infrastructure building in the history of the planet that's going on right now, and it's in the news. So there are so many things, so I can't... Uh, we'll come back to this because... This thing is shaping up so amazingly as we see these caliphates. There are two of them going. ISIS is one. The Ottoman Empire is the other. The Turks. It's so interesting that in Revelation, the means of executing the Christians is beheading, which is so Islamic, okay? It's so modern. So modern. why don't so you open your Bibles with me to uh, Daniel chapter 10. And uh, this should be a very interesting time because um, I haven't really thought about this before. And, and as I was um, this afternoon thinking about which questions I could remember, I started thinking about how prominently Persia figures in the Scripture. And uh, Persia, as in um, Iran today, is the old nation of Persia. Uh, but uh, thanks, Phil, very much. Uh, but what I thought about in uh, Daniel 10, let's see what color we are. Here's Persia. Uh, just to give you a little history, uh, uh, before we look at Daniel 10, to kind of connect between uh, the time of Daniel in the 6th century B.C. and uh, the modern times. Uh, first of all, Daniel earlier in chapter 2 sees this, uh, and I'm not an artist, but he saw this uh, image uh, of this uh, figure. How do you like that for art? They had a head of gold and a chest. So this is gold. You remember all this from Sunday school and silver. Um, and then we had the, the uh, brass, then we had the iron, and then we had the, oh, it, it doesn't. I, I was telling someone this morning, uh, it, probably you didn't notice it, but my slides for Easter Sunday, I had to print six times. The screen had all the words, but the printing of the slides wouldn't come, and I said, we have an unsaved printer here at church. Uh, Ken, you need to, uh, you know, <laughs> go talk, no, I'm teasing, but Ken's an evangelist, and, and he could, but uh, you see the screen doesn't like me uh, uh, for some reason, I'll move that away, but this image in Daniel 2, uh, do you remember the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and the interpretation, it's told twice and it's very significant, but what I, what I want to get to is the gold, the silver, uh, the bronze, the iron, and then the iron mixed with clay. And so it's iron and clay. And the Lord interprets this for us through Daniel, and gold was Babylon. Boy, there's a current you know, in the news, that's a city in Iraq. Uh, the Babylonian Empire would be somewhat parallel to the, not exactly, but the land area of Iraq. Um, and of course, you know that's the area that Abraham was from, uh, the general area, and came up through Turkey going to Israel. So it's all part of the biblical land. The silver was the Medo-Persian Empire. There's the Persia part, which now uh, was renamed, and you all know about, um, you know, the, the process. We got the current unusual configuration of geography in the Middle East. I'll mention that in a minute. And then the bronze, uh, the, the Persians were defeated at uh, uh, 
uh, at that great um, battle where Alexander comes in with his 25,000 and beats an army of a million, and, uh, and the whole Medo-Persian Empire crumbles before Greece. And uh, that, by the way, this, this whole process is detailed in Daniel. Uh, in fact, this is one of the reasons why Bible prophecy is so magnificent. Daniel, in the, the 6th century B.C., actually saw the history into the future from uh, the Babylonian Empire through the Persian Empire through the Greek Empire into the Roman Empire and to the end of days. And it's a phenomenal prophetic study. And then, of course, the iron are the, uh, the people that destroyed Jerusalem, which we know from AD 70 are the Romans. And then uh, this image in the last days, it had, you know, there was an Eastern Roman Empire and a Western Roman Empire. And, you know, that's the, the two legs of iron. And then the feet and ten toes are iron mixed in clay. So just, you know, that's a, a God's overview of all of human history. Isn't that interesting? The first empire was the Babylonian Empire. Now, there were, there were great things, you know, the, uh, all the different things going on in, in the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian area, and, you know, the Indus Valley and whatever was going on off in China and everything else. But from God's perspective, God always puts Jerusalem in the center of the world and the universe. He says his throne is over Jerusalem, God's throne. That's how important Jerusalem is uh, to God. And in fact, even the way God tells directions in the Old Testament is phenomenal. Uh, it, it's posture, I mean, the way God shows us he's situated himself is, before my face is east, behind my back is west, and to my left and to the right is north and south. That's the Hebrew words as if God is sitting in the, the temple looking out the gate of the temple through the eastern gate. God builds his even orientation to us humans around Israel. So this whole map and Persia, I'm, I'm glad, Mr. Tibble, you asked me this. I mean, I'm, I wish I would have had time last week to talk about it because I hadn't thought about it before. But if, if you look at how God looks at human history through this image, God says the first global empire was, was Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Uh, he was, by the Medes and Persians, conquered. You remember they diverted the river and came under uh, the wall and wiped out the Babylonians. And the uh, Medo-Persians took over, and as I said, they were defeated by Alexander. And Alexander basically died of dissipation and corruption and drank too much and whoever, whatever else. And, and his four generals took over. And finally, they were defeated by the Romans. And what's interesting is the Western Roman Empire, you all have heard Rome fell in 476 B.C. You had to learn that in school, or 476 A.D., Everyone had to learn that in school. What, what people don't think very often about is that the eastern side of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire divided, eastern, western. The western city of Rome, the, you know, the, the Italian peninsula, and all of that, that fell to the, the you know, the Visigoths and Goths and whoever else, all these barbarians that came down from Europe. The eastern empire headquartered in modern-day Istanbul, Constantinople, didn't fall until 1453. There were Romans, legionnaires wearing the armor and everything until 1453 A.D. Christopher Columbus was alive during the Roman Empire. That's how, how close to history the Bible, uh, I mean, that's still the Roman Empire the one leg of it was existing until the conquistadors, you know, and we're talking about modern history here. They were conquered by the Ottomans, you know, the Turks, you know, Turkish people. And the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, actually didn't form until 1517, Martin Luther time, fell in 1917 in World War I, defeated by the British, 1917, ending 400 years that they ruled over all the Middle East. All, I mean, the, the Muslim rule, the Ottoman Empire was amazing. 
In 1917, they had to divide up the land, and they, they carved out these countries um, that, as in Iraq, as in uh, Persia or Iran, as in Jordan, as in, you know, all of these, you know, Syria and everything else. And they just kept, the, they just kept partitioning off this land in different ways. So most people think of, of Iran or Persia as kind of a modern thing, but it's not a modern thing. So let's go to Daniel 10. I want to show you and tie together from God's perspective. Um, I think it starts in about verse 13 and, and goes from there. But, um, you know, Daniel in verse 1, is in the third year of uh, Cyrus, the king of Persia. So, you know, just to give you an orientation, chapter 10 uh, immediately follows this incredible prophetic that I've taught through many times, chapter 9. Daniel, in chapter 10 now, is, is having further revelation, and he's in the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. So there's where we are. Uh, we're starting, he's actually in this land of Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire that conquered the Babylonians that Daniel originally had been carried off from Jerusalem as a young boy and uh, was inducted into the civil offices and now he's the prime minister. Uh, it's amazing. And, and we could go through all that history, but look at verse 13. Daniel is, is praying and he's having a real hard time. And verse 13 explains what the hard time is. There is... There is some being called the Prince of Persia. Now, for those of you that are teenagers, you probably know that as a movie or a video game. But it's actually a demonic super angel fallen. Remember, there are hierarchies of angels in both directions. Uh, God made, uh, there's actually... Uh, well, we know for sure there's seven orders of angels downwards, seven orders of, of worse and worse angels that are named in the Bible. Uh, there are also uh, normal angels, uh, cherubim, these are the good ones, seraphim, which there are many similarities between cherubim a cherub is a living one, a seraph is a burning one. Then, then there are these archangels, and we're going to meet one in just a second. He's up here. So we know of four named good. These are the, the good ones. The bad ones, uh, there are plain old demons, but also Paul rattles off some uh, names in Ephesians 6. He calls them principalities and powers and, uh, you know, spiritual wickedness in high places. We also know about the devil himself, Lucifer. We also know about God keeps some of these angels that are the worst, the most malignant. He keeps them in chains, in everlasting chains under darkness. We also know there's one he lets out now and then, but he can't let him out for very long. He's called the destroyer. There we go. It's another video game, isn't it? Uh, it's interesting how much of our modern culture, media, and gaming is starting to draw on biblical named horrific demon creatures. Here's one of them, Prince of Persia. Look at look what's happening. Starts in, in um, verse 10. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble, and on my knees, in the palms of my hands, and, and said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, I understand the words I speak unto you, and stand upright, I have been sent to you. While I was speaking the word to me, I stood in trembling. He said, Do not fear, Daniel, from the first day that you set your heart to understand, to humble yourself God, toward God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. So this is one of the good angels coming to Daniel, and he says to him in verse 13, but the prince of Persia withstood me for 21 days. Now it sounds like Frank Peretti. I mean, we're really getting all over the board here. Thanks for asking us this, Tom Tibble. You know, doesn't this sound like Peretti? And if you read that 10, 15 years ago, you know, piercing the darkness, this present darkness, that whole thing. The prince of the kingdom of Persia resisted me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, 
Michael is one of the two named archangels. Now we know, if you, if you can't deliver scriptures, that there are seven of them. Now the Jews named them all, but God doesn't name them all. And we know that, that Gabriel is one, and we know that Michael here, uh, talked about, is one. We don't know the other five, but we do know this. Jesus said that there are angels who always stand around God and face him all the time. Now, Jesus said that in the Gospels. And he said the context of it is not angelology. The context of it is soul winning. Every time someone gets saved, the Bible says, here's God, and here are seven angels that always surround his throne. And Jesus said, there is rejoicing in the presence of those angels. There's seven of them. They're not rejoicing. Something in then is the Greek word, emprosten, before the face of. Who's rejoicing? God. Every time someone gets saved, God rejoices and they witness it. So these seven are talked about, but they're not numbered there until we get to Revelation. And Revelation talks about, in chapter 1, the seven spirits that are before the throne and they're called pillars or flames of fire. You say, wait a minute, I thought we said angels. Well, they are. They are angels. But Hebrews 1 tells us, actually Hebrews 1, 14, it says angels are, and he maketh his angels flames of fire. So God refers to angels as flames of fire. In Revelation 1, he says he has seven pillars of fire that are always around his throne. And you see them. Uh, here and there throughout Revelation. And two of them are sent off from before his face to do special things. Now, Gabriel's all over the place. We've been seeing him on the map, you know, when we were doing the Holy Land map. Uh, you know, he zipped off to tell Mary, and he zipped off to comfort Joseph, and he zips off to, you know, meet with uh, Zechariah in the incense time, and et cetera, et cetera, all these uh, birth of Christ. So Gabriel seems to, this archangel of the seven good angels and their, their seven malignant ones, uh, orders, this one is always surrounding the, the birth of Christ and Christ and messenger thing. Michael, look what Michael does. Verse 13, uh, the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So there is some fallen angel, uh, a step below Satan, who is very powerful, who is shaping world events. Do you think Vladimir Putin is thinking of all the stuff he thinks of? Do you think that Rouhani or whatever the Persian Iranian guy that just snookered the U.S., you know, in the arms deal, do you think they think of all that themselves? No. They're just chess players are chess pieces that are being played with these, these, this prince of Persia and all the other demons are involved and they were, they were actually withstanding an angel sent from God. Now that doesn't compute with us. We just think, bam, you know, do whatever you want. You know, we're so into science fiction movies, you know. God says go, the angel goes and nothing can stop it. But God has allowed Satan to be the God of this world. You know, some people always are troubled where Jesus said, you know, that, that you call yourself gods and there are gods. There are other gods other than God. There are little g gods. Satan's one of them. He is the little g God of this world. There are many gods. They're demons. They're they're fallen, they're, they're malignant, they're, they're not divine supporters of the true and living God, but they're created beings. And, and they are very powerful. In fact, Jude tells us that when Michael, when, when Michael was facing off with Satan 
face to face, Michael, the archangel, would not directly rebuke. He could not directly rebuke, because he's a pay grade below Satan. Satan was the very highest created being in the universe, and still is. And Michael's not. And he could not order Satan. He said in Jude, the Lord rebuke you. I'm, I, it actually says in Jude, Michael dared not bring a railing accusation against Satan dared not. So there's a whole bunch more, it, and it, you know, we don't spend our lives into this, but there is so much more going on that we don't know about. But now people make a lot of money and make a lot of fantastical claims that aren't in the Bible, but just the stuff we do know is amazing. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, this demon, whatever he is, resisted this angel, and behold, Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you understanding. So now the angel is, is, uh, is telling him what's going on. And then, verse 18, again, the one having uh, the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. So angels, by the way, can touch people and strengthen them. You know, they're doing that with Jesus. Remember in the temptation in the garden, they, they were strengthening him. But then, uh, verse 19, O man, greatly beloved, peace be with you, be strong, yes, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened. And let the Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And he said, now look at verse 20. Now we have another uh, insight into this horrific creature. Uh, Do you know that I have come to you, and now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia? And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. That means that this whole um, image deal, there was, there is a demon, there is a fallen powerful angel, one angel, killed 185,000 Assyrian troops. One. Angels are un incomprehensible to us humans, powerful. There is a demon angel that that is tied to helping Persia advance. I don't mean all Persians are demonic people. But what we don't realize is that world events are being shaped at two levels. God, who has this master plan that's written down in the Bible. The devil, who doesn't believe it nor understand it, is doing his own thing. And God is orchestrating everything that Satan thinks he's doing as the God of this world to accomplish Satan's purposes is actually fulfilling God's. So what does it have to do with Persia? Well, Mr. Tibble said, is there anything in current news that has to do with correlation to the Bible. Well, if you read all this stuff, uh, starting in chapter 11, basically, chapter 11 of Daniel's uh, writings, all the way from verse 1 down through verse 35, is, is one of the most amazing prophetic foreviews or previews of history there is. He, he talks about, in verse 2, uh, someone that you and I read about in, in Esther, Ahasuerus. He's the king there. Uh, verse 3, Alexander the Great rises. He's a mighty king with great dominion. He does according to his will. And that Alexander goes all the way down through verse 9, and, and you can, I mean, get in a good study Bible, you can read that. Then he talks about uh, Uh, Antiochus the Great, and he starts in verse 10 and goes all the way down to, oh, well, verse 20. Then we have someone that that is uh, very famous in verse 21 of Daniel 11. This is the one that sacrifices a pig on the altar in Jerusalem and, and foments the Maccabean rebellion in Israel uh, in the about second century BC. That's Antiochus. And all this goes on and on and on through Antiochus Epiphanes until we get to verse 35. And then 
Daniel switches gears. And most Bible commentators say that in verse 36, we're looking forward to what we would call the tribulation time in the Antichrist. Now, why am I saying all that? Because what you get from Daniel is, Daniel 10 tells us that there is a Persian connection. Uh, there's something going on with Persia uh, that is specifically pointed out by God. Now, go to Ezekiel. I want to show you uh, Ezekiel 38 because we have our second Persian. Um, just back up a book. Uh, Ezekiel actually was captured and went to the land before uh, land of Babylon before Daniel. There were three times the Babylonians uh, took prisoners and uh, most likely in the first of the uh, times Ezekiel was taken and the second uh, um, group, another group came and then Daniel went in the final one in 586. But uh, look at chapter 38 and this is what's so interesting. Uh, now the word of the Lord came to me, I'm in Ezekiel chapter 38, and said, Son of man, set your face against Gog in the land of Magog. Uh, the prince of Rosh, actually Rosh means prince, so it's the, the prince or Rosh of Meshach and Tubal. So Rosh doesn't seem to be a separate geographic place. It's, it's a, Rosh is always used as a kind of a title, um, like Pharaoh. Pharaoh isn't a name, it's a title. It's like president. You know, we talk about the president. We know who we're talking about. But, you know, in future, if we just say the president, they don't know which one unless they can date us. Well, this, this Rosh thing is a prince. So it's whoever is the prince in Meshach and Tubal. So that's great. And, you know, it doesn't really matter. But, but look at what it says if you keep going down to verse 5. It says there are going to be all of these who come against Israel. And I only want you to see the, the first one in verse 5. I mean, all of them are significant because, I mean, just last week, the whole Ethiopia and Somalia and the, the massacre of the 147 kids in the Christian university in Kenya. I mean, the, the Muslims came in at gunpoint, separated the, the Christians from the other Muslims let the Muslims leave and they butchered the Christians. I mean, this, this, this whole uh, uh, stirring up of the South the Bible talks about, it's interesting to watch it start. But verse 5, what I want you to see is in Ezekiel 38, who's at the head of the line that's coming against Israel in verse 5? What's the first word there in your Bible? Say it out loud. Persia. So we know that Daniel saw there is the Persian politics were being deeply behind the scenes influenced by this high-ranking principality and power, this, this demon over a country. Now, there's another demon over Greece. He seems to be wasting money right now if you're following, you know, uh, current world news. You know, the Greeks are going broke. Uh, and falling out of the euro, but, and I'm just teasing about that, probably there's some uh, prophetic implication of that, but what, what we see is this Persian deal figures in to Ezekiel 38 saying that there is going to be a coming invasion of Israel that is headed up by Persia. Now, why is that? Well, if you read the rest, why is that important? If you look at all those other names in verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, and with them, and, and all the house of Gomer, and Togarma, and Meshach, and Tubal, and all that, that group never in history has ever done anything together. This, this is a historical anomaly looking back. Never in history has Persia, Sudan, Libya, Algeria, Turkey, Central Asia, never have they all attacked Israel, ever. This is a coalition coming. And Ezekiel says, the one that's going to rev it up is Persia. 
if you want to find Persia in the news, it's called Iran. There is no nation on earth that has threatened Israel more completely for annihilation. Now, Hitler just wanted to kill Jews. He didn't care about Israel. He just wanted to kill Jews. The Soviets pogromed the Jews until a million of them fled and went to Israel. I mean, we know history. I mean, the, the Spanish martyred and killed the Jews, and on and on. The Crusaders killed the Jews. But no country has so frequently, publicly, categorically, even this week said, there's no reason for Israel to continue to exist, and we will destroy them. Not just we don't like them, we're going to boycott them, we're going to apartheid them and economically ruin them. We are going to kill them. Now, last thing, because it's time to go. There's something that always identifies where Satan is involved. Um, he, it says in John 44, Satan was a murderer from the beginning. Satan... Satan is always close to murder and, and bloodshed and killing. It's almost like a fly. Satan loves killing. That's why I would strongly encourage you, if you're a young man and you have any desire to serve the Lord, you need to abandon killing video games because you're honoring the devil. They're not neutral. Satan came to kill and steal and destroy. Those are the three themes of most male-dominated video games, killing, stealing, destroying, you know. Uh, what is it? Grand auto theft, stealing, and killing and destroying are all the rest. Satan's realm, he's a murderer, he loves bloodshed, he loves destruction, he calls his demons Abaddon, Destroyer, and all that, and this is all the video game stuff. Satan is one who comes to kill and steal and destroy. When Satan is influencing a nation, they only talk about killing and destroying. And I'm not talking about the Persian people. I think the, the Iranian people today, I mean, I, I've baptized several, and, and I count Iranians as some of my dear friends. I'm not talking about the Iranian people. I'm talking about the nation of Iran in the hands of its current leaders who are tied to high up principalities have this unhuman, it's demonic, it's not human, it's a demonic passion to destroy God's chosen people of promise, the Jewish people. And how does it all end? And I'll end now because we only have four minutes. Go to Revelation 12 because what's really interesting is the end of the Bible is all built around all this stuff that Daniel and Ezekiel talk about. God kind of wires it all together if, if you look at the Bible, there's uh, prophecies uh, in Genesis, in Deuteronomy, a uh, few in the Psalms, uh, a lot in Jeremiah, a lot more in Ezekiel, and then Daniel and Zechariah. Those are all kind of streams of prophecies uh, about the last days, but all of them are wired into the book of Revelation. And that's what makes Revelation so interesting. The revelation of Jesus Christ has 404 verses and it has 800 quotations and allusions to, there's even some in Exodus, uh, to all these, these Old Testament books are all feeders into. You can't really understand Revelation without following the, the trails back to what it's talking about. And look at chapter 12. This is just phenomenal. And uh, I think I passed Mr. Tibble's question, but I'll just read this and then we'll quit. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head was a garland of 12 stars. And what on earth would that be? Well, if you go back to Genesis and you look in the life of Joseph, Genesis 37 to 50, bingo. You know what that's talking about. That's a description of Israel. That's a description of the 12 tribes and, and the whole thing that, J that Joseph saw when his brothers were, you know, he saw all of that. It's interesting. Okay, so we've got Israel. And being with child, so Israel has a child. That's interesting. 
And then comes this dragon, and now it sounds kind of like we're in Lord of the Rings stuff or something. I mean, it sounds like science fiction. And verse 4, the dragon gets a third of the stars. That's where we get Satan getting a third of all the angels. That He got one-third of all that they fell with him. But look at verse 4 at the ending. It was ready to give birth, to devour her, that's Israel's, child as soon as it was born. And if you have certain versions of the Bible, child is capitalized. This is talking about Christ. So the nation of Israel had Christ, you know, through Mary and, you know, through the seed of, uh, uh, of the woman, and we've talked about the virgin birth and everything, but it was, it was through the line of, of David and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the, the 12 tribes and all that. But look what happens. Verse 5, she bore the male child who was to rule all nations. That's Christ with a rod of iron. That's Psalm 2. I mean, all this stuff is just wired back to the rest of the Bible. And her child was caught up to God. Now, that's the end of the 40 days after the resurrection, the ascension. Jesus went up. And so the woman fled in the wilderness, and God prepared a place for her for three and a half years. And war broke out in heaven, verse 7, and Michael and his angels fought with a dragon. And all of a sudden, we are seeing in Revelation that Satan has one goal, and he's going to use the nations of the world that will be usable, but Satan's goal is, he has one goal. He wants to destroy Israel because God made a sovereign election of Israel. And if Satan can destroy them all, it ruins God's plan. And so the whole book of Revelation is all tying together the promises of God that he has sovereignly made to his people, Israel. Why do you think God parks his throne over Jerusalem? If, if the church took Israel's place, he should park his throne over Rome. You know, the Roman Catholic Church. Or maybe over, I don't know, Nashville or something. I mean, why does he park it over Jerusalem? Because he has sovereignly elected Israel, and the whole end of the world is all of these prophecies being revealed in how God defeats the devil, and especially when you get to Zechariah, Satan gets every nation on earth to march against Israel. Not Rome and not Washington, Jerusalem. Every nation on earth starts going toward Israel. And Zechariah 12 through 14 says that at the last moment, God rescues Israel. And Israel, Jews, look up and see the one they pierce and mourn and are gloriously saved. So, Mr. Tibble, thank you for asking that. You're not even here tonight, um, but I'll answer it anyway. Uh, in modern news, fascinating is there's a Persian connection to Ezekiel 38, which ties the devil into desiring to destroy Israel, and the current nation he's really fomenting is Iran. And in verse 5 of Ezekiel 38, Iran leads the pack against Israel.